All right. Uh, my name is John Larson. Um, I am a uh, Navy veteran. I graduated high school in uh, 1975, and right out of high school, my older brother Steve actually uh, sent me a ticket to work with him out in South Carolina for a while. He had uh, previously been in the Navy, so I worked with him for about a month or so. What were you doing? He was uh, working uh, building houses. So I went out to, uh, you know, from the little town Argyle, ended up uh, in Goose Creek, South Carolina, uh, which is right outside of Charleston. So he thought that would be, a, you know, kind of cool to work, you know, with his little brother. And, and it was, but again, you know, right out of high school, after about a month, it just really wasn't for me. So I came back home and uh, ended up working for uh, Valley Coverall, Daryl Peterson, because mm -hmm. uh, my mom was working there. Uh, Shirley Sunby was working there. Uh, so yeah, I worked, started uh, working, I guess it was later in the summer of 75. Worked through the winter being a delivery driver, so covering most of northern Minnesota and uh, over in the Grand Forks. And every day, part of my drive, or when I was in the Grand Forks area, part of that drive was by the recruiter's office. There was, a, I think it was a, as a matter of fact, I think it was going into the recruiter's office because we also had rugs to deliver. And having had both of, uh, you know, Steve and my older brother Richard were both in the Navy. Um, but yeah, you know, it didn't really occur to me much at the time. And, and as I worked through the winter, uh, I think it was in the early part of 76, it just being a delivery driver wasn't going to be my life. Um, I didn't have the money to go to school. And Ed, that really didn't intrigue me much either. I just wasn't much of a, you know, college kid, so, um, I don't know, one day I just kind of stopped and got to talking to, uh, I can remember his last name, Dittmer, uh, got to talking to, I think, Navy was, recruiter? Yeah, Navy recruiter. Uh, and where was he, Grand Forks? Or? He was in Grand Forks. Um, <laughs> Dwayne Dittmer, now that I think about it, start talking a little bit, uh, he actually came out to the house here in Argyle, uh, and... I can remember he's like, okay, well, what do you want to do? And I, at the time, you know, I thought, well, uh, accounting was my strong suit in high school, you know, uh, business accounting. So I thought that would be the thing to go into. Oh, he says, we have this test that we'll take. Uh, so he, he gives me this test, and <laughs> I look back on it now, it, it was kind of, you know, uh, a multiple choice, okay, which one of these is a light bulb? And they have like four pictures, a, a screwdriver, a cat, uh, a you know, bulb? just what, and then a light bulb, you know, so it, it wasn't, it didn't take a rocket science scientist to figure this out. By the time I got done, uh, it's like, well, you have an aptitude for electronics. And we have this great program, advanced electronics, you sign up for six years, you go to boot camp, go to your first school, you automatically promoted to an E4, uh, that'll get you a long way when you get to the fleet. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyways, that's, I, I signed up, and in, I think it was April of 76, I started boot camp out in San Diego. They tried to tell me, well, we're going to send you to Great Lakes. And, you know, both Steve and Richard had gone out to San Diego. Uh, and to me, that was just, if you're going in the Navy, you go to boot camp in San Diego. So they put me on a, on a bus to Grand Forks. And, oh, we were in Grand Forks. They put me on a bus to Fargo. From Fargo, they bussed us to Minneapolis to get on a flight. And we flew in. So now it's, you know, a little small town Minnesota and San Diego. Did you know anybody? Not a soul. No, I went in by myself. Uh, they had talked about the buddy program, but yeah, that really wasn't much of an option. Everybody that I knew were, you know, the big name farmers around here, Safranskis and Saltmans and Magnuson. And, uh, 
plus they were all busy in, in school. Now, they all went on to uh, either UND or uh, U of M in Crookston. Uh, so yeah, I ended up in, in boot camp, but I do remember Richard telling me when you get there, you know, if they ask you to volunteer for any kind of special company, make sure you step forward. Tell them that you're a drummer. And I think it was the second or third day we were there, that conversation happened after the uh, uh, trash can wake up and everything you see in the movies about drill sergeants. Yeah, that was uh, that was our first couple of days. And then uh, they asked if anybody uh, wanted to be in a special company. And most everybody else looked terrified, but you know I raised my hand, stepped forward. So I ended up in the drum and bugle corps, which come to find out is really kind of cool. <laughs> You know, everybody else is stuck doing uh, all their, you know, uh, kitchen duties, KP, and all that stuff. Whereas after the first couple of weeks, we're going out every weekend to perform in uh, different parades. We performed out at SeaWorld, uh, uh, some other parades from uh, little communities around the San Diego area. So, you know, that was kind of cool. Uh, you know, we still had to do our, you know, the basic seamanship and all the classes that everybody else does. Uh, but, uh, so that, that was kind of a... So did you have any kind of weapon training? Or none. None. I think it was one day that they took us to a firing range, indoor firing range, and we laid down with, uh, I guess is the M1. You know, we got to fire that, but other than that, no weapons training at all. That came later on the ship. Uh, but yeah, you know, I get out of, out of boot camp, uh, you know, they told me that uh, you're going to be a sonar technician. So, so what instrument did you play? play oh, I was playing uh, drums. I was a... Uh, well, you said drums. A, yeah. yeah, I was a, a tenor. Uh, I guess it was... Uh, yeah, you had your snare drums and then you had your tenor drum. Um, it wasn't anything that I really... You know, it wasn't an exciting thing. The snare drum was what I played in high school, but... I mean, yeah, so I was part of the marching band and... You know, like I said, that was really kind of uh, an experience back in so did 76. did you play in any football games or? We went out to a drum and bugle corps uh, competition at, I think it was UCSD, uh, University of California, San Diego. And we were kind of an opening act. It was all these high schools that were doing this uh, drum and bugle competition mm -hmm. whereas we were just there to perform and I mean <laughs> none of us are professionals uh, it's all a bunch of kids from different high schools or across the country and that are just thrown together and I mean I guess some of these guys did go on to, to be in the uh, to be musicians in the Navy but the majority of us were just there to get out of Doing all the the regular grunt work that everybody else was doing, right. but yeah, it was uh, it was pretty cool. Uh, like I said, we played at uh, San Diego or at the uh, Sea World in San Diego. Uh, we had that drum and bugle corps competition. That was another weekend. Um, God, there's another little town that we went. It would almost be like like Meet Your Neighbor Day or you know uh, Stephen Harvest Days or something where it's a big town festival. Okay. Uh, we got to play there, and then they gave us kind of the afternoon to roam around. So, uh, again, being a sailor in some of these little area, uh, little towns around San Diego, being a sailor was you know kind of a, a cool thing. That and again, back in '76, it was a, a different mentality when it came to military. Um, so was, how long were you in basic? In basic? God, let's see. I went in April. I think I was out. In June? Yeah, I saw it was like 12 weeks of basic weeks training. training. And then from there you... From there uh, they sent me to... Um, let's see, I had to go back to San Diego. In fact, across the street from where the training um, center is was the Fleet Anti-Submarine Warfare Training Center Pacific. And that's where you go to your A school, uh, the first school to learn about sonar. Um, and that was your assignment, was sonar? Yep, yep. I was going to be a sonar technician. They hadn't uh, designated a sonar f 
a specific sonar for me to, to learn. So you get out, you learn the basics of sonar, uh, a basic little bit about operations, um, and while you're in school then you end up getting uh, assigned a, a specific sonar system to train on. Uh, that was the SQS, SQQ23 pair is what I ended up being an operator for. Yeah. And uh, coming out of that school, let's see, I finished up in uh, December of 76 because then I came home for Christmas. Um, and I had to report to the USS Preble, which was DDG-46 out of Pearl Harbor. Uh, and I remember reporting aboard January 3rd, 1977. How did you get the flu? Yep. From? Well, from San Diego, I came home for Christmas. And then, yeah, I just got a flight out of Grand Forks. Uh, from Grand Forks to, I think I flew to the cities. Then to Los Angeles. Um... Oh, well, they did end up, I, I flew out of a, uh, an Air Force base. Commercial jet, or? Yeah, but they had to put me up at this Air Force base, and I can't remember which base it was. But it was uh, just outside of L.A. And then, yeah, well, I ended up flying into Honolulu International Airport, and there was a guy from, you know, I suppose it was 9, 8, 9 o'clock at night, and there was a guy from the Preble. Uh, I went to the USO uh, area in the airport. And then there was a guy you know, holding a sign, USS Preble. So he's like, okay, get your stuff, let's go. You know, and you know, I guess, like I said, it was probably 10 o'clock by the time I get to the ship. Don't know a soul. Don't know anything about, you know, proper etiquette of, of getting aboard. What kind of ship was it? It was a... Uh, it was a DDG, Guided Missile Destroyer. And, Destroyer, okay. Yeah, and we had uh, ASW, anti-submarine warfare capabilities. Uh, and so that was our primary mission was, you know, if you're out there with a carrier, you're there to support, you know, any kind of flight uh, ops they've got going, protect the carrier and hunt submarines at the same time. Um, I did find out that the... They had just come back from a Westpac cruise where they go out to uh, the Philippines, Korea, um, Japan. They had just come back in, in 76, just a few months before I got there. Uh, so my assignment was going to be two years on board the Preble. Those two years, we didn't go anywhere. It took forever for the ship to actually get out to sea. It was such an old ship and broken ship. We had we had more repairs going on that ship that it was just unreal. So, you know, we'd go out for a week or two. Things would break down, we'd come back in. I mean, we'd get out to sea and, and most of these ships are... So were you, what was your living quarters? Were you on base? Or? No, we lived on board the ship. Oh, okay. Um, on board all these ships, you've got different berthing areas for all the different divisions. Um, the area that I was berthed in, you have three racks that go from the floor to about head high. So there's three racks there. You can stand uh, in an aisle and then less than an arm's width away is another set of three racks. So our when division... You say racks, is that like bunk beds? Bunks. Or? Yeah, they're the old bunks, you know, where mattresses about three inches thick. Uh, it's a tray rack where you can open it up and then your locker is underneath and when you close it down. So, like I said, you've got three of these stacked up. And we had, I suppose, 15, 15 people in our division. And we're just all, I mean, you've got... A set of racks that you got another set of racks and and everybody is in one small area and uh, they keep them grouped by division or departments at least uh, you got engineering department uh, weapons department operations um, navigations and supply were the five departments so 
within those departments is everybody that's needed to actually operate the ship. But yeah, like I said, we'd go out to sea and things would break. I mean, uh, once we left port, the equipment that's supposed to make fresh water, that wouldn't work. <laughs> so, you know, you're out at sea for a week or two and, you know, they, they'll turn the water on long enough so you can, or they'll let the water be on in sinks in the in the head, in the shower area. So you can brush your teeth and you can shave, but there were no showers. It just couldn't support having that much, making that much water. Uh, at one point I came back home on leave with uh, one of my buddies, uh, Pee Wee Caldwell. And we came back, God, it was in the springtime, because I remember we flew into Fargo, and all you could see was water. It was one of these where the snow had pretty much melted, but had water Spring everywhere. Spring flooding. Yep. We stayed for a couple of days in, in Fargo, uh, met up with some of the people that I knew that were going to school, you know, uh, and then we came up to Argyle for a while. And at that time, the ship was supposed to leave uh, Pearl Harbor, was going to come to San Diego, and then Pee Wee and I, when we finished up with our leave, uh, we were going to fly back to San Diego and meet the ship. We get there, there's no ship. And come to find out that uh, they had cut uh, two days out of Pearl Harbor and went dead in the water. So they <laughs> ended up getting towed back to Pearl Harbor, made the necessary repairs, and then they were still coming to San Diego. So they put us up in uh, uh, barracks and we had, you know, uh, working on the naval base, the San Diego naval base where all the ships are at, because San Diego has a bunch of different bases. But we were down at the, uh, uh, down at the piers and well, we'd report to work. They'd send us out, uh, you know, we'd pick up trash here or, uh, you know, do a little painting there. And that's what we did, you know, for, I think we were, assigned temporary assigned duties, TAD, to the base for about a month before the ship showed up. And then once uh, once the Preble did show up, it was in no condition to go anywhere. So we ended up uh, spending another, I think it was about three months, in San Diego while repairs were made to the ship. Uh, once it was seaworthy again, we went back to Hawaii uh, that's about the time I got my new orders to go back to school to get to my uh, advanced electronics training. So they, we got back to Pearl Harbor and it was again like January 2nd or 3rd was when I was getting ready to leave the ship. I spent the morning checking out. I went down was uh, at a hotel not far from Honolulu International Airport so I could have a couple of beers before the flight and so I mean I'm sitting out in sunshine it's you know 76 78 degrees January 3rd 1977 and uh, I was gonna fly into Minneapolis I get on board the plane in Hawaii we fly to Seattle never getting outside right you go from your plane through walk through your little tunnel you get to the airport same thing get back on another plane and then i'm flying non-stop to minneapolis steve was at this time living in little falls he was going to pick me up uh, so we fly into minneapolis still january 3rd 1977 where i got on the plane at 78 degrees I get off the plane and it was like 24 below. So in that one day, yeah, that's kind of a shock. But uh, yeah, I came back home and, and spent about a month on leave. Uh, spent a few days with Steve and then we drove up to Argyle and his, uh, <laughs> he had a yellow Volkswagen at the time. It's not a car you want to drive. I think it was a, God, early 70s. 
Motors well, in the back. <laughs> yeah, 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 and there's nothing to stop the cold from coming in the front. <laughs> yeah. That was the coldest, miserable ride getting up to Argyle. But then from there, they sent me back to uh, uh, San Diego. I was going to go back to the Fleet Anti-Submarine Warfare Training Center Pacific, where I was going to be a ANSQR-17 sonar operator slash technician. So what's your rank now? Let's see, at this point, I was a third class E4. I uh, had just taken E5 exam and was waiting on results. When I get to San Diego and they put me, start putting me through school, uh, first you ended up having to go through basic electronic electricity. So that is at the Naval Training Center, which is basically you're looking at, you know, uh, what was it, about 14 or 15 city block square uh, for the Naval Training Center. The fleet uh, ASW Training Center was right next to it, and then there's a walkway where you can go from one to the other. Like I said, I went to boot camp in San Diego. So to go from ASW base to the Naval Training Center, there's also the bridge that goes over to what they called Worm Island, which is what they called all of the recruits when they come in. They're nothing but worms. So you had to spend your first two weeks on Worm Island before you'd come over to the training center as a recruit. So, And then as a recruit, you're taught you salute anything that has any kind of an insignia. Because, uh, you know, company commanders there were... E5, E6. Um, so, as an E4, uh, and then I guess it was only a couple of months after I was there was when I made E5. So anytime you go over... So now you're a chief? No, no, E5 would be um, a second class petty officer. Okay. Hadn't made... Yeah. Chief wasn't even on the horizon for me at the time. What but is that E what for a chief? E7. E7. Yep. Um... But yeah, anytime you go over to NTC, you see these scared recruits, which, you know, hasn't been that long, you know, a couple of years. I was one of those scared recruits. But yeah, they're saluting everything that moves. So you got to, no, no, you don't got to do that. But, uh, but I ended up going through basic electronic and electricity, a self-paced course, uh, and I struggled. I just, I, I knew enough you know, that I had to get through this. But at the same time, it was always so much fun to get out and go party. But, you know, that was all another part of the whole sailor life that uh, that can get very... Uh, yeah, it just wasn't... I said before, I wasn't good at school. Being in this basic electronic electricity was a self-paced course. No, I'm not a self-paced person. Someone has to be there. It's pretty involved, yeah. So, yeah, after, after a bit, when you struggle long enough, then they do step in. It's like, no, you're going to be here. We're going to watch you, and which is good because I needed that at that time. Um, it was about that time, once I got through basic electronics and electricity, they sent me back to the Fleet ASW Training Center, which is, I'm living in a barracks there now, um, going through this SQR-17 maintenance uh, course, learning how to uh, troubleshoot, fix it if it breaks. And it was a type of sonar uh, that was a, kind of new to the fleet where most people when they think about sonar, or if they ever think about sonar, uh, sonar is, is hull mounted or they had at the time was kind of brand new to surface fleet, uh, a towed array which is nothing more than a big listening device that they would pull behind the ship listening for submarines. The SQR-17 was a, um, uh, they used sauna buoys, which is carried in helicopters and would be dropped in different patterns. You know, once a submarine's been detected, we send the helicopter out. Uh, the operator would always be in, in direct communication with the helicopter, telling them, okay, drop this buoy here, and then, okay, drop another one there, and and once we got a pattern set, you listen to see where the submarine is, and depending on where their track is, you can direct the helicopter to keep dropping sauna buoys. So 
you have a track. The advantage over that is the ship doesn't have to be anywhere near the submarine, so you can do this tracking without them knowing they're being tracked. Um, it's just a big game between submariners and uh, the surface fleet. We were taught and um, quite extensively about at the time, our biggest threat was the Soviet Navy. So we learned a lot about all different types of Soviet submarines, uh, from diesels to their uh, newest and latest and greatest nuclear submarines. The worm drive, is that what they call it? Is it a worm drive? Well, like that? that part of Hunt for Red October is a little bit fictitious. Okay. Just a little bit. But I guess I that's where I got it. Yeah, you know. <laughs> But the, the neat thing about Hunt for Red October, it's fairly accurate about um, how sonarmen operate on board, you know, submarines. And with the advent of this uh, uh, SQR-17 with dropping sonar buoys, uh, also the surface fleet. Later on, uh, another ship's uh, another ship that I went to had what they called the uh, a towed array system which is similar to what submariners were using at the time, not, maybe not quite as advanced as some of the submarine sonars, but we were getting there as far as surface fleet went. But yeah, I mean, that was our job. We were going to hunt submarines. Uh, when I came out of, I uh, re-enlisted while I was there as an E-5. Re-enlisted. You were in for four? You were, you I was in for six. You were in for six? Yeah, I was automatically in for six. But now, let's see, this is... Yeah, uh, for me, yeah, it was well, all about... your choice of school. Yeah, and it was all about, uh, I guess I re-enlisted at a very early time. Had I waited, there would have been more money involved, but at, at the time of my life, I was young, and it's like, oh, no, i got to have money, i got to keep partying. And uh, so I re-enlisted as an E-5, bought a, uh, or at least made a down payment, on a 1979 MGB, just yeah, just a nice little car. Go kart. Yeah, basically a go kart, but it was fun. Um, and by the time I got done uh, in San Diego, going to all these schools, hoping I was going to stay on the West Coast. Of course, I get orders to the USS Peterson, which is a new Spruance class destroyer, anti-submarine destroyer stationed in Norfolk, Virginia. So a buddy of mine was from, he was from Michigan. He also had uh, orders out to Norfolk to the Mooseburger, another Spruance class destroyer. So since he was going to be driving out there and he's got to pick up, it's like, okay, tell you what, you know, we ended up with a tow bar. We uh, uh, hooked up the MG towed it as far as Iowa, we disconnected, he went on to Michigan, I came up to Minnesota in my little MG, it was the fall of 70, let's see, I'm trying to think now, it was 79, so yeah, it was the fall of 79, and I ended up uh, you know, spending time at home, left the car behind, uh, Flew out. Well, I find find out that the Peterson is is still overseas, and it's making its way back from a, a cruise. That's the uh, ship. Yep, the Peterson USS DD nine sixty nine. Um, probably the two Spruance class destroyers that I spent time on uh, were the uh, USS Peterson DD nine sixty nine, and later on I ended up on the USS Spruance. DD 963, which was the lead ship of the class. Um, but I had to fly to Rota, Spain. Can I stop you one? Sure. Yep. This is take two. Okay, so I had to catch up with the Peterson over in Rota, Spain. They were coming back from a, a Mediterranean cruise. I believe they had also spent time in the Persian Gulf. I'm not real sure. 
Um, but anyways, I, I fly from Grand Forks to Philadelphia. From Philadelphia, they put us on an actual military flight. It's a, a commercial airliner, but it's nothing but military. Everybody's in uniform. Okay. And we flew to Rota, Spain. Um, I don't know how many hours it was. It seemed like forever. And that's not the the plane that they use isn't the most comfortable. I mean, it's a commercial type plane, but it's an older model, not much legroom. Um, so yeah, I spent about a week waiting for the Peterson to get into uh, Rota. Um, God, I'm trying to think here. I'm losing track of some time. When they did get in. Um, We spent, or the ship was there for about another three days, and then we made the cruise back to Norfolk. Uh, so then I started, you know, meeting more of the crew. Uh, trying to think, this was would have been Christmas of yeah, it would have been Christmas of '79, or yeah, right '79 when. Uh, as we were coming out of Rhoda, we spent Christmas at sea. Uh, and then we get into Norfolk, Virginia. And How long did that take? Uh, going across, it's only about a seven or eight day transit. Um, generally, when you're going out on a cruise, it's more of close to two weeks because uh, a not like taking a cruise uh, you know on the you know the northern princess or whatever any of these cruise lines are they go from one point to another point straight line quick as they can navy ship you get out there and they're always maneuvering because you, you don't want to be a, a sitting target so but on the way back from a cruise they take a little bit straighter course uh, so yeah, it was about a seven, eight day transit. So how long, what's the longest cruise you were on? What's the longest you were on? Oh, I suppose the, the longest cruise was on the Peterson. Um, I'm thinking that was the better part of seven, eight months. The longest period we spent at sea without coming into port, uh, I'm thinking that was the better part of That's when we were headed to the Persian Gulf in 80, 81. And I think we spent, at that time, we spent just about 40-some uh, days at sea without pulling into port. Yeah. Um, How was the food? Food is actually really good. I was, I was amazed. Um, first ship I was on, probably not so good. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's because of the coast, because of the age of the ship, uh, because of the people fixing it. When you get to the Spruance, it's a, a newer, or guy, when I got to the Peterson, it's a Spruance class ship. It's a newer ship. It was, uh, it was then and still considered now probably the elite ship that the Navy ever had. And a lot of us, you know, old timers kind of scratch our head, why did they ever get rid of it? Uh, because the Peterson and the Spruance are both now uh, part of the uh, coral ecology off the southern coast of Florida. Um, they sunk them? Yep. Okay. And let's see, they commissioned the Peterson in 1977 and in 2005 it was sunk in the Gulf of Mexico off the southern portion of Florida. Um, but yeah, I mean, the food was good. Uh, most most Navy guys say the food was pretty good. Yeah. I've interviewed quite a few of you guys now. You know, they all said that... Yeah, there, there's some that... There's some that said that it was yeah, you know, airline. But. Yeah, there's, there's some of the meals, you know, you kind of, yeah. But for the most part, you know, I mean, nobody ever starved on one of these. And I saw a lot of guys get bigger. So, <laughs> you know, they were all eating pretty good. Um, Trying to think here. During that cruise where we spent all the time 
out in the Persian Gulf, that's back when um, we had hostages in Iran. Uh, and that was about the time that Reagan was coming into office. At the time, the, the hostages had been there for quite some time and, and they were we were scheduled to go out for our normal Mediterranean cruise. You know, so we all get prepped and, and ready to go. Um, and again, we go, we stopped in the Azores for fuel, uh, into the Med. Uh, we stopped in Port Said, which is the northern part of the Suez Canal on the Mediterranean side. And then we had to transit the Suez Canal, which eh, was really interesting, actually. Um, you know, you're thinking about something that's connecting the Med to the Arabian Sea. And I don't know, I guess in my mind, I thought something that was going to be this big expanse that you're sailing through, but it's not. It's a fairly narrow canal that these big lord ships are going through. And about halfway through, uh, there's a lake. I can't think of the name of the lake. But that's where you pull off, you anchor, because as you're heading south, you have ships from the south end coming north. And that's where everybody kind of stops and you let some traffic go by and then you get to go by. One lane high. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. So yeah, and then when we get to the south end, we stop for fuel again in Djibouti. Little country off of... Uh, would be the northeast corner of Africa and the port you pull into is Djibouti and the country's name is Djibouti. So from there we were going to transit into uh, into the uh, Persian Gulf. To get through the Persian Gulf you're going through the Gulf of Oman, uh, Straits of Hormuz, boom, now you're there. Uh, there's a small naval base on an island called uh, Bahrain which is where, you know, if you need supplies or something, that's where we'd come into. Uh, we didn't really get, I mean, we got to go into the uh, marketplace. <coughs> but most of what sailors do after a long time is sit and drink. And in Arabian countries, or, you know, Middle East countries, that's frowned on. So we spent most of our time on the base. Uh, which is not to say that wasn't, you know, uh, that was kind of a fun time too. Um, going into that cruise, they had asked for people to uh, get international driver's license. <coughs> so that intrigued me, so I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll apply for one. Okay, great, sign your name here. I signed my name, okay, here. So that was my international driver's license. Sign a name, you get that. Which proved to be beneficial because as we went to different places, if the commanding officer or anybody in the officer's corps needed to go somewhere, I had the international driver's license. There was a few of us on board, but I'd you know, get to drive these guys and, and go where they want. Uh, <coughs> in Bahrain, they had had a ship's party on base. <coughs> And all the officers that were there had had a little bit too much to drink, and they missed the bus that was running back and forth between the base and the ship. So I uh, get the driver, get Larson, STG2 Larson. Okay, great. So I ended, ended up driving these guys, and it was like being in a taxi because at the end of the ride, oh, here, here, take this. So I mean, I made about uh, close to $200 that night. But, uh, you know, again, you know, uh, some of the other ports that we were in, having to drive uh, in Italy, Naples, Italy. We have roundabouts here in the States now. Not like you have in Italy. <clears throat> we have, you know, two-lane roundabouts that I've seen. Italy's about a eight-lane roundabout. Hmm. Oh, God, yeah, I mean, you're taking your life in your hands. You know, if you've got to get... And it's not just, you know, three or four you got to know roads. Where you're going. Yeah, you've got about eight or nine roads coming into this roundabout. So yeah, that, that got to be tricky. 
you know, it took about three times around before I figured out how to actually get out of them. But, uh, but yeah, that was that was interesting part of the side well, line. That, I lived in Lincoln for years, and they had a three lane <coughs> roundabout, okay. and they had so many accidents they had to take one lane out. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah, I, mean, I just I couldn't imagine what would happen if you had something like that yeah. in Italy. It's like holy <laughs> crap. Um, but <clears throat> I digress. <coughs> Excuse me. So anyways, as part of this cruise, we were going into the Persian Gulf. Um, the couple of times that I've been in a Persian Gulf was way before anything was declared a war zone. But that didn't mean people weren't shooting at you. I mean, we had these gunboats that would, you know, come make their runs, uh, you know, on their little Zodiac boats. <laughs> Uh, itty bitty things coming at these you know big warships. So in the in the Persian Gulf, uh, there's not much room for submarines to hide. So they had to do something with us. So they ended up mounting 50 cal machine guns on the bridge wings. So that was since we're part of weapons department, the sonar technicians got to learn how and qualify using 50 cal machine guns. And that was our job. Any little gunboats come out, captain call, you know, okay, let's go. We get up there, load them up, and we'd wait for him to, you know, go ahead, fire away. Shit, we weren't going to hit nothing. I mean, <laughs> you've got guys that, you know, it, it's their dream to shoot big guns like this, but ain't nobody hitting anything. But uh, it was enough of a deterrent to get the little, little guys away from us. Um, after the fact, we found out that the Peterson was one of the... Uh, rescue uh, plans for the hostages that were there. We had an aircraft carrier was with us. They were sending um, helicopters in. They were going to, actually the first attempt was going to be the helicopters were going to go in, come back out to the aircraft carrier, and we would escort the carrier. But in their attempt to get to where the hostages were, they were flying low. Something happened, uh, sand or something got sucked up into one of their engines and they lost two or three helicopters. So they had to scratch that plan. That was um, near the car administration, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, like I said, it was right at the very end of Carter with Reagan about to start to take power. So the next plan was they were going to go in with helicopters again. This time they were going to bring them straight out to us. <clears throat> us meaning the Peterson, uh, I think there was two other Spruance class destroyers out there. We all had capabilities to uh, have helicopters land on us. So they were going to bring us the hostages and then we were going to, you know, hightail it out of the uh, <clears throat> Persian Gulf. <clears throat> I'm getting a dry throat. I haven't talked this long in a long time. But, like I said, that was when Reagan was coming into power, and once he took office, they ended up releasing him. Almost the next day. Yeah, pretty much <laughs> it was. So, yeah, after that, it was, uh, you know, we cruised back out, back through the uh, uh, Suez Canal, through the Med, back into, you know, came back to uh, Norfolk. Um, once we got there, we had a little bit of stand-down time. Uh, <clears throat> it was just after that was uh, when I actually met and, and started courting my first wife. And while we were going out, I can't remember what I did. I was going through, uh, I had been sent for a refresher training for operation on the uh, 17 sonar, which I was a uh, technician for. And while I was in school, I had, I had developed a, a blood clot in my leg. And so they ended up sending me to the hospital. Shit, I spent about, I think about a week in a hospital on blood thinners. Because it was a golf ball size clot in mm. my calf. So because of that and being on blood thinners, I couldn't go back on a ship. as too much of a medical danger. Um, I ended up being TAD to uh, the Naval Training Fleet ASW Training Center Atlantic, where I ended up being uh, an instructor 
Uh, at that time, yeah, after I was uh, sent there as TAD, and as long as I was on blood thinner, I couldn't go back to the ship. Eventually, I talked with a uh, Navy detailer, who's the guy that writes our orders. And I was about due for a transfer, kind of an early transfer, but I talked him into assigning me as an instructor at the uh, training center, ASW training center, which he did, uh, which is where I also uh, made first class. Um, so then while I was there, I spent uh, two years as an instructor, got married, uh, just so you know, this that was number one. I'm on number three now, so it was a good time for a while while it lasted. Uh, I don't know. To me, I'm I'm very envious of people in the military that can make something like that last. I'm just not one of those that could. So, uh, but then while I was at ASW Training Center, I was able to, um, like I said, I I made first class E6, uh, and had also. I don't know, volunteer work, uh, try to, you know, basically pad your resume because when you go for E7 or Chief Petty Officer, they take a look at, besides just the advanced uh, advancement test that you have to take, they also take a look at your service jacket, make sure that you've, you know, you're going to be Chief type material. Uh, by this time, my oldest brother Richard is living out uh, in the Virginia area. He was a career Navy. Uh, he had also, I think he was a senior chief at the time, uh, but I had gone through, like I said, two years of training or two years of instructing. Um, <clears throat> and then it was coming time for my, uh, for that to be done. And again, talking with the detailer who I s ended up being friends with, and the guy's name was uh, Thomas Heinrich. Uh, in fact, I'm still in touch with him today. Uh, so Tom ended up getting me assigned to a new sonar system, newest sonar system that the fleet had. Uh, uh, it's called the SQ, SQS-53 Bravo was the designation of the sonar system. It was so new that the Navy wasn't teaching it. It was being taught by uh, the manufacturer, which was... Uh, GE. So when I left Norfolk, the first uh, there's a whole package that was being uh, put onto the spruance. The spruance was in the shipyards. They took off what was considered the um, uh, as, called ASROC system, which was an uh, anti-submarine rocket. It was a torpedo that with a rocket motor. Uh, but they were taking that off um, and installing the VLS systems, uh, vertical launch, which I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Uh, so while we're going through this school, like I said, it, it was basically new to the Navy. It was being put on the Spruances, was going to be the first uh, ship with it. So. In order to be to get all this training, you had several different aspects that had to get. Uh, you had school to go through. One was uh, considered a, they called it the power supply school. Okay, that's in San Diego. So I left uh, Norfolk, drove my pickup, took the southern route I-10 all the way across uh, the southern part of the states through uh, Georgia. Uh, what else is down there? Alabama, Mississippi, uh, yeah, Texas, and then I drove through Texas, and then some more Texas. And that's the most god-awful, because Highway 10 starts at the most eastern part of Texas and oh, exits at the most <clears throat> western part. So, yeah, it was just an ungodly drive. But then I go to school. So uh, I get to San Diego. Uh, I'm going through, uh, it was power supply school, I'm trying to think, it was probably about three months worth. Uh, okay, now let's see, we're going to teach you, oh, we're going to teach you how to operate the SQ, uh, 
SQR19, which was this toad array that's going to be on this bronze. Okay, we're going to teach you that, but we're going to teach you that up in Groton, Connecticut. <laughs> okay, so back in the pickup, back across the southern route to Norfolk, then up to Groton, Connecticut. And that was about a two-month school. So, okay, now let's see what was next. Um, I'm not even sure what was next. All I know is it was in San Diego. Because I had to drive oh, yeah. from Groton, drive across, back to San Diego for another, I think it was uh, four months worth of school. And it was while I was in Groton, though, was when the results from the Chiefs exam had come out. And I had made E7. So, what are we now? We must be pushing 80, I think this was 85. So in like nine years, eight, nine years, I had gone from, you know, being a, a recruit in boot camp to now I'm an E7, which is fast. It's normally, you know, takes several more years for most others to get that, that far. So, you know, that was kind of a feather in my cap. And, and as part of uh, going from an E6 to an E7 in the Navy, you actually change the color of your uniform. You go from wearing the dungaree blues to wearing a khaki uniform. And I'm not sure how it is in this day and age because of being politically correct and everything else they do, but back then they had the initiations, and they still do, but the initiations were a little bit different. Um, and it's how to prepare someone to become a chief. You know, they, they break you down, they make you humble, they make you realize that uh, you know, in order for you to get anywhere, you've got to be able to provide leadership and, yeah, anyways, they make you do all sorts of stuff. And because we were in um, a training type facility, there was, I had no real chiefs that were above me. So it was decided that my brother would be my sponsor. Richard? Yep. So he's the one that kept you? Yep. When we finally got through the day of the initiation where uh, I had to eat a bunch of dumb stuff, and, but he's the one that uh, pinned my collar. Yeah. Special day. So, now I've got one more trip to make. We still had to go back out to San Diego. Uh, well, actually, two more trips, because, yeah, after after that, uh, making chief, we went back to San Diego, and what year did the Challenger explode? Do you remember? No. That's... I remember, I remember exactly what happened, but what year yeah, happened? Yeah, because I had gone back to San Diego, uh, and it was like my second day of work. I was basically... Um, assigned into an office with a bunch of other senior and master chiefs. And some of these guys are, <laughs> their sense of humor leaves them a little to be desired. But anyways, I come into work and they're like, oh man, did you see that? And they've got TVs going. And I'm like, what? And they're showing a replay of the Challenger going up and exploding. And this one uh, master chief comes walking in, looks at the TV, shakes and says, yep, you should have asked for a Bud Light. That was the big you know, commercial back then, sure. you know, we're all like, oh man, you know, a little too soon, but, uh, but yeah, that was, I, I remember that day vividly, it was uh, walking in and, and seeing that on the screen, but uh, I ended up completing, again, can't remember what school it was, but I was out there for a few months, then came the big one, then we had to go and actually learn the 53 Bravo maintenance which is being taught at the GE factory in Syracuse, New York. Back across the country, up to Syracuse, um, and that was, we got there and, we got there the last week of college. Because I remember they roped off the streets downtown Syracuse, and from bar to bar you could walk, you know, uh, no, car, vehicular traffic at all, but you could walk from bar to bar carrying whatever drink you wanted. Um, 
you know, they had uh, uh, a weekend, I remember going out, they had the, uh, the Finger Lakes by Syracuse, but they had the sculling uh, competition for the colleges. So, you know, for one week you're, you're just smothered with college kids and all this college competition going on and then the next week they're all gone and Syracuse is just another town. But we ended up going to the GE factory where they have a complete mock-up of this new sonar system and they teach us the maintenance and how to operate and, and uh, so that was, you know, pretty interesting. So from there, now it's time to actually get to my next duty station, which is USS Bruins DD-963 in the shipyards in Pascagoula, Mississippi. And I've never been in the shipyards. All this time I've never had to be in a shipyard. And I get down there and it's still up on a dry dock. So our living quarters is what they call the living barge. And basically it's about four different decks of nothing but bunks. I mean, you know, there's different rooms that house, I think it was six guys to a, uh, a room. But that was our living quarters until the ship was ready for us to, and we couldn't move on it until... But being it was a chief, you didn't have your own room? Not this time we didn't, no. And uh, on board ship, we have our own birthing area that's just the chief petty officers. Um, yeah, every time I went to any kind of training as a chief, yeah, I had my own room. That was the nice thing. But, uh, but yeah, we, uh, we were there I'm trying to think of how long before. Uh, it was only a couple of months that I was there when it finally got you know put in the water. We ran through tests, and then it was going to its home port in Mayport, Florida. So... At that time, there was several of us that we ended up driving vehicles from uh, Pascagoula to Mayport, which that's a god-awful drive, too. That's about an eight, ten-hour drive um, while the ship came around. Uh, it wasn't too long after that was, uh, now we had our, our full crew. I had Tom, Tommy Heinrichs, uh, uh, Tommy Wayne Miller. Uh, all these kids that had gone through all these schools with me. I wasn't the only one going through all this. I had a crew that uh, went with me and uh, we got to be, you know, all of us got to be really, really tight. Uh, you know, I'm still in, in, in touch with a lot of them. Uh, but yeah, then uh, our first cruise, uh, that's when, again, we were still, uh, things were, the Cold War was still kind of at its height where uh, the Russians were still out playing games with their submarines and they had just come out with uh, the Oscar uh, submarine, which in with the Caterpillar Drive and Hunt for Red October, that's the one they were talking about. Uh, so we had the distinction of, uh, on the Spruins, we tracked uh, one of their newest submarines, I believe it was an Oscar, coming out of uh, Russia, coming out of the fjords up by uh, Sweden, Norway. And uh, we held contact on that submarine for the better part of 14 days. And we tracked it, you know, coming out. And it didn't really take a lot of evasive action, so I'm not sure if it realized that we were tracking them. Uh, but we tracked them uh, into right at the uh, Straits of Gibraltar going into the Med. And then we had to give our track over to ships that were in the Med. Uh, but yeah, we ended up getting uh, accommodations for that. Uh, we had the, you know, the longest continuous track of a Soviet submarine, which is you know, kind of a feather on our hat. Um, but it also, while on the Spruance, was... Uh, you know, all this time, you know, you talk about being a sailor that uh, I drank with the best of them. And it was starting to take its toll. Uh, one of the things I ended up doing was I uh, went through a rehab, dry dock is what they call it. And it was just before the Spruance was getting ready to go overseas uh, for its major cruise. 
the whole tracking business was not part of a cruise, but so they were going to send me to dry dock in Norfolk, which was, I think that was four weeks of, you know, going through meetings, talking about your feelings, you know, going out to AA meetings at night. Um, it, it didn't really work. Uh, yeah. I tried to think of what was going to, but it didn't. Uh, you were but, ready to give it up yet? No. Uh, yeah. You know. Uh, it would be a few years before I'd get to that point. Uh, actually, quite a few years. But when I came out of dry dock, Spruance was underway. So I had to meet up with Spruance. Okay, so they were going to go through into, you know, the, on their way to the Persian Gulf. So, I mean, I've, I've got to travel a lot <laughs> being in the Navy, back and forth across the country, you know, them four or five times. Well, now, we're going to catch up with the ship. So I'm home ported in Mayport, Florida. They flew me up to treatment in Norfolk, Virginia. I finished there. From Norfolk, I fly to Los Angeles. Okay, Los Angeles, now we're going to fly to Hawaii. Okay, now we're going to take you to Guam. So I flew to Guam. Then I had to fly, I think we stopped in the Philippines, and we had about a two, three hour layover there where you could actually get out from the plane. Oh God, just, uh, I'm Florida, southern part of the country gets muggy. Yeah, not like you walk out in the Philippines and I mean, it's like you get hit in the face with it. But then from the Philippines, um, God, they took me from there to uh, a little island called Diego Garcia. You have to get a good map, you know, any, globe that you get won't show it because it's just a little horseshoe in the southern Indian Ocean and it's a British colony so uh, it, it's a military installation that's used for listening uh, different I mean you had British you know all allies have members there but when you get there, they give you this indoctrination about, you know, don't mess with the chickens, don't mess with the crabs, don't mess with, I can't remember what the third one was, because those are British subjects. <laughs> and if you mess with them, you're going to be in trouble. So anyways, I had two days there, and from Diego Garcia, they flew me up to Oman. I got to an airstrip in Oman, and they're going to... Uh, they helicoptered me out to a supply ship that's in the Arabian Ocean, which is the southern part of uh, the Suez Canal, empties into the Arabian, Arabian Sea, I guess is what it is. So they helicoptered me out to this supply ship. I ride a supply ship for three days until we get close enough to where the Spruance is at. The Spruance is going to do an underway replenishment, meaning they're going to fill up with fuel. So the Spruance comes aboard alongside, you know, they get probably 25, 30 yards side by side. And they shoot lines across and they haul over the fuel, uh, uh, fuel lines connected into the Spruance and then they pump fuel in. When they get all done with that, the Spruance sends our helicopter over to put me in it to take me back and they put me on board you know everybody captain everybody hey how you doing glad to see you thanks you know glad you're here chief so at that time uh, we ended up going into the Persian Gulf for a little bit uh, and again we're uh, let's see that was after the Stark and some other events had happened, we still weren't at war, but it was getting more tense where as gunboats were coming out and shooting at us, they're sending bigger boats. It's getting a little bit more serious. Uh, we're firing back, trying to hit them now, trying to sink them. <clears throat> but again, we hadn't made no, de there's no declarations of war or anything. Um, by the time we get done in the Persian Gulf with our time, then we come back out and, um, you know, back through the Suez Canal. Well, we got to stop in Naples. 
this was my favorite cruise because then when we stopped in Naples, uh, we had, I think, a week there. And out of that week, one, the total race system that we had on the ship, there was some issues with it and we had to change it out. The only way to change it out is to pull it off and feed a new one in. Machines can't do this. It's pretty much manual. So you have all the sonar technicians doing this. So we're working overnight, pulling the old one out, you know, feeding the new one in. So since we're working, the ship is obligated to feed us. So they bring us out sandwiches. Now, while we're out here in Naples, Italy, they have dogs that run the pier. I mean, these are just, you know, you see the ribs and everything on these dogs. And they're always, you know, searching in garbage and stuff. Or busy, you know, working. We eat a few of the sandwiches, and then somebody's like, "Well, hey, why don't we just feed the dogs? We take a sandwich, and just throw it out to the dogs. They, three of them, come up, sniff that sandwich, and turn around and walked away." <laughs> and it's like, "Oh my God, you know, starving dogs in Italy won't eat this." But, but anyways, yeah, after we get done with that, I did have the opportunity to go to Rome. Spent three days uh, on a whirlwind tour. Saw more churches than I would even believe, you know, existed. Everything you, you see in Rome is, you know, some sort of a church or cathedral or catacomb, you know. So we got to see all that. And after we left, uh, when we left Naples, we spent a couple of days just cruising the Med. Uh, then our next port stop was uh, Palma Mallorca. That's a little island off, the, uh, off of Spain. And we find out that that is, that's the working collar, the blue collar man's uh, uh, Riviera. Uh, so uh, we met people from all over Europe there. Uh, Norway, Germany, uh, Sweden, you know, they were all there. Everybody vacationing. And I mean, we spent, yeah, we spent four days there. And that's, it was while we were there that they decided that, you know, twice a year we had to do our physical tests. You know, you, you got to run, uh, what was a half a mile in like 12 minutes or something, you know, push-up, sit-ups. So, yeah, like I said, I, had, I had met the ship after going through alcohol treatment. And then when, by the time we get to, to uh, Palma and have to run this test, I'd spent the night before along with several other chiefs just getting, you know, sloppy drunk and we're all out there hungover, trying to do push-ups, trying to do sit-ups, and then we had to run. Oh, that was a miserable day, but we made it. And then after we left Paula, then we took a trip up, uh, came out of the Med, up to the North Atlantic, where each of the major uh, circumference lines, the Arctic Circle, um, the equator, I don't know, what do they call the one down south? I don't even know. Anyways, each of those when you cross, there's a ceremony. Uh, when you cross the Arctic Circle, you become part of, uh, you become a designated a blue nose. But in order to be a designated blue nose, you have to uh, go out and take part in a ceremony where the very front chalk or hole in the bow where we feed a line through is called the bull nose. In order to become a blue nose you have to take part in going up and painting that blue. Easy you say. But you gotta do it in your underwear. And doesn't matter what time of year you get up to the Arctic Circle it's cold. And they point the ship into the wind. So you're out there, you know, standing in line with all these other guys in your underwear, freezing everything off, just to take a couple of swipes with a paintbrush so that you can become uh, part of the Order of the Blue Nose. <laughs> you get a really nice certificate that goes with it in the card and all that. But uh, we get done with that. Then we did go into uh, Aarhus, Denmark. Um, we got blockaded by Greenpeace. Uh, so <laughs> things like that, in order not to be a big bully, uh, what they do is they, they charge the fire hoses and they let you know crew members just 
blow all these little boats away with the fire hose. Well, same sort of thing happened as we got pier side. We're trying to lower the ship's ladder down to the dock and all of you know, <laughs> Greenpeace is down there trying to get in the way. Uh, uh, there was no malice or anything, but you know, there's guys up on the ship with these fire hose. I mean, you're talking, what, 150, 200 PSI coming out of a fire hose? And we're directing it down at the dock. A couple of them got knocked down, and, and but they all got up laughing, and eventually they walked away so we could get it down. But uh, you know, that was kind of funny. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, that, you know, we uh, from our house, we spent a few days there. Uh, so... I've gotten to see things that I'd never be able to see otherwise. Uh, from Aarhus, we went to uh, Kiel, Germany, spent a few days there. Uh, and from Kiel is when we made our way back to Mayport, Florida. So that, in a nutshell, is my around the world trip. Mm -hmm. uh, Very interesting. Know. Yeah, you know, and then, uh, like I said, the, the drinking was... Uh, has always been, had always been a problem. Let's see, so as a chief, I suppose now we're looking at... How many years you got in, John? Uh, I had 14. So it was in that magical 14th year was uh, drinking was a problem. My uh, estranged wife was in Norfolk. I was in uh, Mayport, Florida. Uh, drugs had always kind of been a, an issue with me also. Uh, and it was uh, the group that I was with, that I, the crowd that I was hanging with, you know, they were civilians and, uh, yeah, they weren't, they didn't really follow all the rules either of laws. Uh, but it was with them that uh, cocaine had been uh, kind of a, that was of my drugs, cocaine, I guess you could say would have been my drug of choice after drinking. Um, and it was during a, um, uh, a shipwide urinalysis that uh, I was busted for having cocaine in my system and I ended up in front of the commanding officer. And I just remember uh, when I was signing up to go into the Navy with Dwayne Dittmer, my uh, recruiter. You know, when they ask you all the questions about do you do drugs, you know, have you ever tried marijuana? And he said, okay, if you have tried marijuana and you want to go in the Navy, you answer no. But if you answer no, that's what your answer always has to be. So now 14 years later, standing in front of the commanding officer, and he asks, you know, were you taking drugs? I, the words of Dwayne Dittmer flashed, and I'm, I remember thinking, my recruiter told me, always say no. So I sat there and, and told him, no, I do not take drugs. You know, and he looked at me and says, well, I'm sorry, Chief. You know, we've uh, tried to help you through your alcohol, but it's time this train keeps on going and we can't wait for you anymore. We're going to have to put you off the train. And he says, we're going to process you for release from the United States Navy. And I was just kind of like dumbfounded, you know. Um, 14 years, got to do things I'd never uh, been able to do. It took me another, took me another 14, yeah, about 14 years, because I was in July of 1990 uh, that I was released. Uh, when I came, you know, it took about two weeks for them to process it all. When I came back to the ship, uh, they, in fact, they called me back to the ship after, every day I'd have to check in, but uh, the, that final day they called me in uh, to be at the ship at five o'clock. That way, commanding officer, executive officer, nobody was on board. Uh, and at the time they were supposed to take my uniforms, take everything, you know, ID card. Uh, but the people that were on board uh, decided to let me keep my dignity, you know, uh, as much as they could. So. Yeah, I left with the uniform on my back. Uh, a few days, uh, yeah, a few days later, I was so far down on my luck, I ended up back in Minnesota. Several months later, the Spruance and the Peterson and other ships unleashed the uh, 
tomahawk attack on Iraq, Iran over there. Uh, so yeah, I missed out on that by a few. But it was in, let's see, I got, yeah, it was in 2004 was when I decided that you know, maybe drinking was, it was enough. You've been sober for a long time. Quite a while. Yep, since um, August 22nd, 2004. So. And you've done well. Yeah. You know, and I guess thinking back, yeah, things could have gone different. Uh, I remember talking to some of these people that uh, I was on board the ship with, and they said at the time that the chief master at arms, the police force of the ship, um, was a friend of mine. And what was this? Uh, would have been 10 years after, after the fact, talking with Tommy Wayne Miller. Uh, he says, you know, if you'd have told Mac that you thought you might have been dirty on that B test, he'd have pulled it. You'd have never got busted. If it had been that time, it had been the next one. So, <coughs> John, we're just about running out of battery yeah. on this. So, I, wa I want to thank you for doing this interview. And sure. Th thank you for your long service. Thank you. Yeah, it was a uh, it was a pleasure. And like I said, you know. Everything that happened to me in the past is what's made me what I am today, so. And you've done well. Uh, thank you for your time, too, sir. Thank you, John. You bet.